Hey, everybody. Happy Labor Day weekend, and welcome to another edition of the Coach's Corner on the Fitter and Faster platform. I'm your host, Mike Murray. Today, we are thrilled to introduce you to the head coach of the Hudson Explorer Aquatic Team and Hudson High School, my good friend, Cleveland Indians extraordinaire fan, Matt Davis. Yes, go Tribe. Thanks, Mike, for having me. <laughs> As a reminder to everybody watching, you can catch all the replays of Coach's Corner on our website. You're just going to click on the all webcast link at the top of the page. During Matt's tenure, at the Heat record books have been rewritten. Since 2005, there's been more than 400 Heat team records broken during the short course and long course seasons. In 2018, Heat won its first Every Club of the Year award given to the top team in Lake Erie. Heat has several national swimmers who compete at various levels throughout USA Swimming. Matt has been voted as the Lake Erie Senior Coach of the Year in 2009 and 2018 by his peers. In 2014, he produced a junior national team member in Ross Palazzo. And during his time as a high school coach in Ohio, the team has broken more than 40 varsity pool records, varsity team records, eight state champions, one state record, and had 50 plus high school swimming and diving All-Americans. Pretty impressive, Matt. Uh, and more than 120 all Ohio performances. You and I have been talking about this. We've been going back and forth. I want you to introduce to the world the bet that you and I have. We have we have two conflicting sports teams. We actually have three if you include our little rivalry as clubs. <laughs> the first one is Michigan Ohio State. If they were going to play this year, I want to know who you think would win. Number two, we have the Yankees and the Indians in contention for, for AL championship this year, although the Yankees right now flat out stink. And then Victor and, and Heat, we're going to meet at, at some meet coming up in the future. So give me the Ohio State-Michigan prediction first. Well, you know, you have to, it has to be a competitive game for it to be a rivalry anymore. And I feel like the rivalry of Ohio State-Michigan isn't even really a rivalry because Ohio State dominates it. But it's a beat um, down, man. I'm it hurt. is. You know what, though? The tables turn at some point. You know, it's the way it is. So I'm just enjoy, enjoying that. Um, of course, I think Ohio State, it's kind of a shame they don't get to, you know, hopefully they'll get to play at some point. Probably one of their best teams in terms of um, athletes and, and, and where they're at with, with their roster right now. So kind of be a shame to, to lose that season for all those kids. Uh, so we'll see. I'm probably a bigger Cleveland sports fan. So the Indians-Yankees rivalry is way, way bigger in my heart. So you know, I, we, we've talked about it, but we need to have a little bet. So if the Indians and the Yankees play in the postseason, which, uh, you know, could happen this year, we would uh, make a little bet. So if the Indians win, you and your wife have to travel up to Cleveland and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hang out for a weekend. You'll come to practice. If not, you know, we'll, we'll come up that way to the Finger Lakes, drink some wine and, uh, you know, come up and hang out with you, you guys for a weekend. So that's it's on uh, paper, Matt. That, that, that bet's on paper. It's happening. So, the, you know, the next couple of weeks you're going to predict here what happens. I know we're 40, 40 games in as of today, so 20 games to go. We're two-thirds of the way through the, the sprint. I know. Can you believe it? It's, it's great. It's, 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 it's so actually great. kind of fun. It, it, I, enjoy, I enjoy baseball. The 162 games can be a little crazy. So, you know, this 60-game this, uh, season is actually kind of fun to, to watch and know that every game's even more important. So, so true. That's a great point. I, I, I hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. I do want to jump right into the topic because you and I have a lot to say on this. And, and in my opinion, you know, of coaches in, in our area, you've done a really fantastic job helping your athletes transition from being good club swimmers into great college swimmers. So when we think about what that successful transition looks like, uh, talk to me about that. What, what are you guys doing at Hudson to help prepare those kids to make that jump? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I, th I thought about for a while when I first took over at, at Hudson now 15 years ago, we had a pretty good high school program. The club program had a decent amount of kids, but nothing really, you know, where the level we're at now. And, you know, I'd have maybe my one best swimmer every year with like, oh, I'm going to go swim in college. Or I thought about it. And when I talked to a lot of the high school kids back then, it wasn't something that they thought they could do. And so early on, you know, we, we talked about it. I talk about it with the kids a lot. Um, especially with our high school group, like, hey, if you want to get to the next level, there's a place for you. And so as the team started to get better and more kids started to, to swim at the next level, a lot of our kids on our team, you know, have, oh, man, I think I could do that. Or, hey, you know what, you know what, I want to start looking at schools. And, you know, when it really 
when it really made a big deal. I have a picture in my, in my office at the pool. One year we had nine of our kids just on our high school team commit to either swim or dive. Um, that's that just that one class um, about five or six years ago now. And then every year we have, you know, several that, that want to go to the next level. So, you know, for us, I think it's just educating them and getting them to know that it doesn't matter if you're the best swimmer on the team, you know, college swimming isn't for just that one person out there that's on your club team. It's about, you know, finding the right fit for you and finding the, the place that, that you can go to. And, you know, I always advocate for my kids like, Hey, you know what, listen, you, you need to find the place that's best for you academically and, and athletically is something that if you can compete at that level, you know, you should really look at it. And no matter it's division one, two or three um, schools, there's a lot of schools out there that, that want good swimmers. No doubt, Matt. And I think you, you said it really well. You value the progression of your athletes within the program having the opportunity to even swim in college, right? I mean, that, that has to be one of our number one priorities at Victor is just creating, creating the opportunities for these kids to continue to compete in college after high school, no matter what level it is. I think that has to be a, a, a dynamic part of your program. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, having that value and knowing that, you know, you can go and, and continue to do that. And, and I know for us, like and on the club level and high school level, is we can do so much for our athletes, but I'm excited for them to get more out of the sport when they can go to a college setting and have, you know, better weight program. They can have, you know, obviously greater facilities. They can have great coaching and they can have a lot more and, you know, even other kids that are better than them to train with. So, you know, some of our best kids have, have gone on to swim at great programs, but I want that for them because I want them to be challenged. Sometimes I can't challenge them the way that they need challenged, you know, with, with, with where we're at in a club setting. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I think it's great for them to go see what they can actually achieve at the next level. And, you know, and, and there's a lot of kids that go out there and do that. And that's, it's awesome to, to witness and to kind of keep track. You mentioned education when you talk about how you bring the discussion of college swimming to your membership. At what year do you start talking about college as a, a potential for your athletes, college swimming as a potential option for your athletes? Yeah, so the way our club works, I mean, we're, we're mainly our high school or mainly Hudson residents, I'd say about 80%. So we do have kids outside of our, of our um, school district that, that come, you know, and train with our club team and things like that. And even like our national level kids, we have kids that aren't just Hudson, but we spend a lot of time, you know, early on, really every, every high school season with our high school athletes and tell them like, hey, this is a possibility for you. So kids are getting that from an earlier age as, you know, freshman, sophomore. Now that the kids can be recruited even sooner, it's, it's one of those things, hey, you probably need to start planning. Like, hey, if you're a freshman in high school, it's not that you have to pick a school now, but you've got to start to understand the process. You've got to understand what the coaches want and, and you know, the avenues that you should be looking at, um, you know, probably early on. So we really have that conversation, you know, with our high school team um, and, the, and our high school parents too. But, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've always told them sometimes it's intimidating that setting. I'm like, listen, if you want to sit down and talk or you know, me and you and your parents and, and the four of us can sit down and we can kind of, you know, lay a, a roadmap of things you need to do. So, um, you know, I think that that, that that's probably, a, you know, helpful for a lot of our families um, and they take advantage of that, which, which I enjoy doing because I've had some pretty bad experiences of kids in my coaching career that didn't really involve me in the process, which is totally fine. But they thought, oh, I'm going to do this, do that. And they get to situations where probably aren't the best situations for them. And I want them to involve me because I want, I want to help them and give them advice because, you know, as parents and kids, you go through this one time, you know, if you have, if you have a couple of kids, maybe twice, but you and I in, in club coaches, we go through this all the time. So, you know, we have some, some resources and we have some advice that will help, you know, so, but I can't do it just like we tell the kids, I can't do it for them. Like, if you want to meet with me, I'll, I'll you know, tell me when and where, but you know, they've got to, you know, ask and, and I'll be willing. I think that's so important when, when, you, when you talk to your athletes that the minute they're in ninth grade, the clock kind of starts ticking, right? And so you're starting to put together the educational format for them and how they proceed in the process. What are some of the first steps that you talk to your kids about when they're looking for schools? So a couple things that, you know, just on the recruiting side is, you know, the college swimming.com website over the years has grown, has been awesome. And they pretty much have most of the meets in there. So we really encourage our kids to get on that profile, 
and hey, make sure that you sign up for that and you make sure the information is accurate because a lot of coaches, you know, will kind of ping your profile from there. And there's so many, there's so many schools all over the country, you know, they're not all going to know you without certain things like that. Obviously, times are times in our sport, which is really great, you know, but that's one of the things that we, we encourage them. If they're going to look at those Division One or Division Two level with scholarship, you know, to, to, to start really working on that NCAA clearinghouse to make sure that the kids, you know, get that filled out because it's something that, that needs to happen. And, you know, we're, uh, we have a, you know, good group of kids and, and usually the eligibility side is never really an issue, but you know, that needs to happen no matter what, how, how good of a, of a student you are and what type of grades you get, it needs, it needs to be a priority. Um, you know, cause coaches are going to ask if you've done that yet. So those are the first couple things in terms of that. Um, I start to get them if they ask, ask me like, well, what else should I do? You know, there's, there's a couple big boxes that you need to check, you know, and some of them are location, like you're, we're in Ohio. So if you're a kid who wants to stay close to Ohio, all right, well, you know, there's a couple states and there's a lot of schools we can look at, but we can probably chop off a good chunk of schools if, if you want to be at least within a couple hour drive of Ohio. You know, if you want to go to a, a, a program that has men and women, unfortunately, there is a lot of schools out there, just women and not men. And there's some that are combined. So if, if that's important to you, you know, start to look at those schools that have, you know, that have the, the you know, both teams um, that compete. You know, and just the size of the school, I think, is important if you want to go to that big university where, hey, I want to go to the Ohio State football game on Saturday or I want to go to the Michigan football game on Saturday. Like if you want that big school environment, you know, that's also something that's important to you. I swim at a small D3 school. We had all those sports, but it wasn't the, you know, it wasn't the crazy tailgating and all that stuff that you see at the major universities, but not everybody wants that. So, you know, those are the you know, the school side of things that I get them to start to think about. Go visit schools that are in urban campuses. Like we're in Ohio, Cleveland State is, is a place that we swim at all the time. You know, Cleveland State's downtown and downtown Cleveland. Some kids want that urban feel. And Miami of Ohio is a place that's out in the middle of nowhere. And some people really like that. So th those are the type of boxes I think you need to check as a, as a, as a student athlete to say what's really important to you and what, what can you deal with that's not a big deal. Those steps are so important, Matt. And you mentioned right out of the gate, the NCAA Eligibility Center. That's where we start here first, because almost every prospective student athlete questionnaire is going to ask for that number, right? So yeah. going through that process and getting that done. The other thing that I'm hearing you, you say is let's, let's really early take an early look at geographically, where do we want to be? Do we want to be close to home? Do we want to make that transition to living far away and really being self-sufficient? Uh, where mom and dad aren't going to be able to take a couple hour drive to get to your dorm room. That's super important. Then we're looking at setting, right? Do we want to be in a rural setting? Do we want to be in a city? So I think that those are really critical early choices that these student athletes have to make. One thing I say to a lot of kids, when you mentioned some kids are really interested in going to that big name division one school. I was before I transferred. I was too. And so and I went to a prep school where there was maybe 22 kids in my biggest class. And so like, are kids gonna be able to manage and make that transition from a small school setting to a large university where you're, yeah. you're essentially in a lecture hall with 150 other kids? Can they handle that? Are they ready for that? So yeah. those are some of those initial discussions. And then I think a, a great segue into the next part of our talk is, what is it like from an experience standpoint to talk about to your families whether the choice is division one, two, or three. Tell us a little bit about how you manage that with your athletes and your families. Yeah, I, I think it, it all goes into expectation and really what you want to get out of the the next step. You know, there's you know you always hear the analogy big fish in a small pond. You know things like that. You know what do you really want? Are, are you a competitor? Do you want to go somewhere and compete, be a part of a program, and help and help that you know that team contribute? You know, we're, we're fortunate enough that our high school team has, has been pretty good, um, you know, the, in the last 10 years or so. And, and so our team's always competing for championships. We're always continuing competing for, you know, big events, even when we've gone to sectionals and futures and stuff like that. Like, you know, it, it's more it's just as much about the team doing well as you doing well. So if you want to contribute to that team, then where do you fit? into those, you know, where do you fit in, in, in on that team? So I always suggest, hey, go to the team's website. They always have top times. Look and see where you'd fit in in that team that if you have a specific school that you want to go to. You know, if, if you're the fourth, the fourth fastest 100 flyer coming in and you're on the depth, down on the depth chart, 
you know, you might not compete right away, or you might not travel right away, or you might not really be in some of those events, you know, that you might normally think you're in. If you go to that school and, you know, you're going to be the top dog, you know, is that what you truly want to want to do? So, you know, is getting them to understand who they are and what really makes them tick in terms of a competitor, because just because you can go to a big school in Ohio state or Michigan or USC or whatever, but you're, the seventh or eighth best breaststroker or sprinter or distance freestyler, you know, you might never really get a chance to contribute to the team. So while you're on the team, you might not really enjoy it as much because you're not in that competitive environment that you're used to in high school, you know, and some kids, you know, some kids want that. Some kids, Hey, I need the challenge. Like I want to go to the best school because they have the best coaches and they have the kids that are way faster than me. And that's going to push me to be better. But, you know, just that expectation of going in. So one of the things that I can, uh, that we, we, given out to our kids. Do I have, can I share my screen here? Yes. All right. So one of the things I know that I've, I've talked to you about this a little bit, but it's really cool. This is from, a, I think two years ago from 2018. And this is just some of the, the division one schools uh, or the division one conferences. But what I really tell kids when they, when they're interested in swimming at the next level is go to this, you know, go to this chart or go, go research the schools in the divisions that you're looking at and, and more specifically the conferences. So if you look at this chart here, Hey, I want to swim at the sec, you know, maybe not, you know, looking at Kentucky or, you know, Auburn or Alabama or whatever it is, but, you know, pick the 200 IM for instance. And this is, uh, you know, the women's and men's the second one down, you know, the top 16 in order to, to score at the sec, you need to be a 157 IM. -er. Well, if I'm a coach at an sec school, I need to recruit kids that are going to help my team get better. So I need to recruit kids that are, you know, at least top 24 coming into my program or top 24 at the conference meet in those events. So, you know, I try to show kids, if you think that you want to go to a certain school or a certain conference, you know, where do you fit? You know, most likely colleges are going to start at top 16 to offer you a scholarship. So if you think you're going to get a scholarship, go to that conference, go to that, you know, your best events. And if you can score top eight or top 16, then a scholarship is, is probably a conversation that you might have with that coach. But if you go in and you're two or three seconds in a hundred slower than what it, what it takes to score points in that conference, most of those schools in that conference probably are going to look elsewhere because, you know, it's a business too. They, they want to get better. So they're going to recruit kids that are going to help them get to the next level. So this is something that I like to use. Um, and I, and this is just one of the sheets because I have pretty much all the division ones from this particular year. Um, but this is really a great starting point. And then the hard part is, you know, you look at some of these, these uh, smaller divisions, like, like we're in Ohio. So the Mac is a big school. There's, there's Akron, there's Miami, there's OU, there's Eastern Michigan, um, Toledo, Bowling Green, Buffalo. And you might not know that conference very well, but then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, what are the schools? Like I could fit in that conference. Like I'm, I'm this good of a swimmer. I'd be top 16 in that conference. And you might not go to Akron because, you know, they may be the best school in the conference, but Hey, you know what? Bowling Green or, or Ball State or Buffalo, they're all schools that I can look at, not just, you know, that one school. So um, Matt, that's I, a great I, point. And I just want to jump in for a second because I, I want parents to understand and I want athletes to understand when they're looking at this fantastic chart. And I have one just like it that we use at Victor. Um, when you look at this chart, you're seeing the power five conferences plus the Ivy League. So you're getting a really good in-depth look at, at the fastest schools in division one and, and the fastest conferences and who's doing what. The other thing I want people to understand, Matt, is my club coach, Jerry Adams, Connectedy Swim Club, he has this phrase that he goes to a lot, and he says, Mike, the world is fast. You take a look at some of the times at Akron. You take a look at some of the times at Eastern Michigan, uh, the Buffalo women. These athletes are going very fast in that conference. Division One as a whole is very fast. Absolutely. And, and Division Three and Division Two as a whole are very fast. You and I talked last time about the unbelievable things that athletes from Kenyon, Denison, Emory, uh, MIT, th these athletes are going incredibly fast in Division Three, And you yes. might have a more similar Division One experience at a Denison than you might at a mid-major Division One school. So it's all relative, you know, and, and finding and understanding how fast you have to be in order to compete for some things that you may have thought were gonna be a lot easier to attain, i.e. a scholarship mm -hmm. uh, or a slot at an Ivy League school, you better be ready to understand what the expectations are. Exactly, and, and really what it takes to get to that level. Because I think, um, 
I think a lot of times with, you know, if you've got a, a good high school swimmer that might be the best kid on the team and he's always the best kid since, since freshman year, everybody's telling him, oh, well, you're so great. You're wonderful. You made the high school state meet. You're this, that, and the other. So you're going to go to this big time school. So, so those kids have the expectation, well, I, I'm, you know, I'm the greatest kid on my high school team. So I could go to Ohio state or I could go to Stanford or Texas or whatever. But at the end of the day, like where, what is your time compared to, the, you know, what this chart says, if you could be the best kid on your team, but you know, if you're not a 420, 500 freestyler, you're probably not going to go to one of these big time schools. You know, it doesn't mean that you can't swim at the next level, but it's probably not at a big time school. And, and you kind of reference some of the division three schools, um, you know, they do some awesome work down there. And I know for me being a competitor and playing two sports in high school and college, I was a baseball guy, hence why I love the Indian so much, but it's one of those things that, you know, that I, uh, I like the team at atmosphere of it. So I'd rather go to a, a smaller school and contribute and also fight for a team championship or fight for a national championship, like at a Kenyon or Denison or Emory, then maybe go to a division one school or a division two school that, Hey, we're the, you know, we're the, we're nine out of 10 in the big 10, or, you know, we're the worst team in the sec, but Hey, I went to a division one school and swam, you know, again, that goes back to what's important to you. You know, if you, if you, you know, are battling out for a title for a team title conference or, or, you know, division three national championship and you get that ring on your finger, you know, for the next 30 years of your life, you're going to reminisce with all your buddies on how great that was. Not that you won't have that at, at, at a division one experience, but you know, if you're, you know, going to the big 10 championship and you know, you're, you've got one kid and your team has one kid in finals or you're going to sec championship and your team's not really scoring a whole lot of points. Like, you know, that's, if that's what you want, that's, that's obviously your, your decision. But to me, you know, I look, I, I'm a competitor, so I want to be in, I want to be in the thick of, you know, those meets and, and know that, hey, my, my uh, swim can make a difference in our team. It's so important that you say that, Matt. And, and you mentioned earlier, you know, when you come from a club like Hudson or you come from a high school team like Hudson, both programs that you coach, every single year your team is relevant in the championship conversation. And athletes who grow up inside your club, maybe from 10 years old all the way up, every March – or December, or whenever that championship meet is, they expect to be in the conversation, right? It is very difficult, and I know from personal experience, going from something like that into a college program where you're just, at Rutgers and men's team, we were never going to be Big East champions back then. We were mm -hmm. trying as hard as we could. But it was hard to operate inside of a, of a situation like that where we weren't sure what was going to happen. You know, it was kind of every year I, I'm so used to being at this level. And now, you know, and that's not to say that the coaches weren't doing a phenomenal job and the, and the team didn't buy into our goals. It was just a lot different. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that's a big motivating factor. Right. And it's something that you and I spend a lot of time talking to our kids about why it's yeah. so important to contribute to team success. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, one thing that a lot of athletes and parents do, Matt, after they start to narrow down their schools is they come up with that top five list. Can you talk about what top five schools should go into people's list? What, what are the characteristics of those places? You know, I think it goes back to the, the first, you know, few things that we talked about are, are really your fit on the team. You know, I think that obviously the recruiting visits are great and it, it, it kind of sucks right now that kids aren't able to do some of that stuff with, with COVID, but, you know, going on those recruiting visits with the kids and with the athletes and seeing what the culture is like there, you know, what happens there, obviously, you know, partying is going to happen, you know, football games are going to happen, you know, even the practice settings and things like that. So how, how does that, you know, how does that really fit what you really want? Cause I've had kids go on recruiting visits and they'll come back and they'll say, Hey, how was it? They're like, well, I'm not going there. I'm like, why? It's like, well, they took us to all these parties because they thought that's what we wanted. And, you know, that's not me. And, you know, some kids that is them, but, you know, that's not me. And so, like, they're, I cross them off the list because of that stuff. So, you know, I, I think it's got to be tough in the college setting for coaches to, you know, get their athletes to make sure that the kids are getting a college experience when they come on that visit, but also being true and authentic. Hey, this is what you're going to get every day. I think on some recruiting visits, sometimes you get sold a false you know, a sense of this is what we're doing, but it's really not. So I think going to on those, on those visits and asking those, those kids that are, you know, been a part of the program for two or three years, like, Hey, what's, 
you know, what's this team about? And, and I know that a lot of times it'll be freshmen and sophomores that take the kids around, but really ask the juniors and seniors. They're the ones who've been around that program for the longest. They're the ones who've been around the coaches for the longest. They're the ones who've been to these classes, have, you know, been part of what, you know, what that culture is, has been like for more than a year or so. You know, get to know those people and, and who they are outside of when the coaches are really sitting there kind of directing traffic of what should actually take place in those visits. Because you'll find out a lot, you know, those kids will talk. And if the, if the culture is bad, they'll talk. They're not going to try to get people to come to that environment if the culture is bad. If the culture is good, you know, they're going to have great things to say about the, the coaching staff, the university, um, you know, their teammates, and, and you'll know if it's the right fit. But, you know, I think that's, I think that's a, a huge part of, you know, when you go, because you could go to one of the greatest programs in the world, but if all the people in that program aren't necessarily what you're trying to look for, you might not really flourish and, and you might kind of, you know, maybe end up transferring or going somewhere else. So um, I think that fit. Also the coach, the, know what you want as a coach or from the coach. Um, you know, for me, one of the things that I enjoy about coaching is the relationships and, and being able to, to have conversations with kids and, and have that. Not every college coach is like that. They're going to expect that you're going to come in and you're going to know A, B, and C, and you're going to do A, B, and C, and I'm not going to have to tell you twice, or you might be looking for another team to swim for. So, you know, know what, what that coach is all about. Know what's important to that, to that coach. And, you know, if, if you need certain things, if you need your, your, your hand to be held by a coach, there are certain coaches out there that you probably shouldn't go to those programs because they're not going to do that. They're going to, you know, make sure. And even the training side of it, you know, what type of training are you going to get um, you know, we've had kids go to a lot of different programs. One of, one of our swimmers, you know, obviously, and you've had swimmers there at, at University of Florida. Those kids are going to train. You know, they, they, they uh, you know, one of my swimmers, Ross, would call me and, and tell us, you know, we might, we might look pretty tired or whatever, but, you know, Troy tells us every day there's not a team in the country that's out training us. So we, we at least have that to hang our hat on. So, um, and then there's other programs that, you know, certain, certain events, certain things are more important and they're going to train a different way. So, you know, looking at the team culture, I think is important. Looking at the type of training is important. And, you know, looking at what the coaching staff, you know, will provide for you and what you really need. And, and I think that goes um, to you as a swimmer, what do you actually need and in, in to, to hold yourself accountable of like, what's actually important to me? Because some people say, oh, well, I've got an offer from this Big Ten school, so I'm going to go there. And, you know, because it makes me look great because I'm going to a Big Ten school. But if the, that school doesn't provide those three or four things that really are going to make you flourish as a, as a swimmer, then most likely you're probably not going to be there for four years. So important to understand those, Matt. And, and you, you talked right to it was culture, right? And as a recruit, if you, if you're lucky enough to come from a program like Hudson or any of the other great programs across this country, club swimming programs, you're going to identify whether or not that culture is a culture of success a culture of support, uh, a culture that has a vision and, and goals. You know, when recruiting is really important to a college team, that's a place that you want to take notice of. You know, if the athletes are really invested and you can tell, it's easy to tell, then that's a place that you're going to look at. You know, one of the things that, and this is certainly not a blanket uh, endorsement, but one of the things that some Division three schools do a really great job of, like a Kenyon or an Emory or a Denison, they make it a practice to have the current athletes send handwritten notes to recruits after they visit it. I mean, that's, that's such an important thing. You make those connections. And when you see that the current athletes on the team value their culture and, and think that you would be a play a, a positive role in it, boy, that, that's a place that sets itself apart from others. Is that, is that your experience as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think having those kids buy into the team goal of what they want to accomplish is, is super important. And I know when you have, you know, for on our high school side and club side, you know, when you have those ninth graders come in and they're really good and all of a sudden, Hey, they might take some relay spots or they might take somebody, you know, they might take these, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be in the mix for, for our team to do certain things to have the people around them support that and understand that and be like, well, you know, that's going to make me better. That's going to push me. Um, and knowing that, hey, that's not my spot. That is the team spot, and whoever's the fastest is going to take that. And I think sometimes in some of those environments where the culture is not great, it's all about me, 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 and not about, well, you know what? If this kid's coming in, they're faster than me, then it's only going to make our team better instead of, oh, this kid's coming in. I don't want this kid to come in because they're going to take my spot that, you know, it's supposedly, you know, what, what I should be doing, and I'm entitled to that. And I think, 
going into those, those places and those cultures where we want better kids to come in to help our team goal, not we want kids less than, less than me because I don't want to lose what I'm doing. You know, those are, I think that that's important. I mean, that, that's important at our high school level. And, and it's challenging for high school kids to even like set aside, hey, this is what it's about me, then it needs to be more about the team. You know, we're, we're actually reading a book with our seniors this year that servant leadership. Um, and it talks about Great putting book. other people's needs first. And, uh, you know, I, I probably say it a million times all the time, like, you know, I'm going to give you what you need, not necessarily what you want, because what right. you want is totally different. So it's actually, it was a good book. My wife and I went for a little camping trip a couple weeks ago, and I actually took that with me and, and read it, and, and I really enjoyed it. So it's really helped me. The other thing you mentioned, Matt, that's incredibly important is training styles. What are you walking into? How is it different than what you've done as a club athlete? What are you looking for? You know, one of the things you and I talked about last time was I really look at my job as uh, an age group coach, right? And when I say age group, I mean 18 and under. We, we, we say senior swimming a lot of times, and that's important too, but I think an 18-year-old is an age grouper. So I do a lot of work on creating a training environment where they're building their capacity, they're learning how to, they're learning how to train. They're learning how to train differently through different modalities and doing my best to prepare them for whatever's going to come at the next level. I think it's also important for me to understand inside of what I do that when they get to college, they might not need to do as much as they've been doing with me. And so every program is different. How are you preparing your athletes to handle that transition from what you've done at the club level with them to what they will be doing in college. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things, that you, you, like you said, talk about training. There's so many different, different ways to do it. And, and there's a lot of great coaches doing, getting some great results doing, you know, probably complete opposite of maybe what was done 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know, I, I think having those kids train it and, and build that base at a younger age is important because I don't think once you get into your, your late teenage years and into college, you can't really trained to be the aerobic person that you are when you're probably 11 to 14. Um, you know, so I think, like you said, doing that early on is, is really impactful. But I think getting the kids to understand what, what they need and what works best for them. Um, you know, certain kids that we have, I, I, I think I mentioned this before we talked about it. One of our best swimmers, 400 IM or made Olympic trials. We did a set of 60 25s on a minute, you know, just to literally all out as fast as you can go. She got to like number 15 or 20 and she was like, I think I'm going to puke. And this girl will be able to swim. You know, she, she trains as hard as I've ever had anybody train. And we're doing 25s. And she's like, man, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to puke because it's so, it's so hard. It's just different for her. So honestly, for us trying to get kids to, to try different things and do different things, like, yeah, we're going to do some aerobic stuff. Hey, we're going to do some sprint type stuff. We're going to do some IM work. But getting them to do all that stuff at a, at a younger age, I think, is important. Um, but really getting them to understand what they need at the next level, because you know, the coaches are going to have a lot of different groups, a lot of different sets, a lot of different things going on in a practice session for, you know, for the college team, especially a lot of those bigger schools. So know, hey, you know, what, what's going to help you get better? You know, and, and again, it goes back to what you need, not necessarily what you want. Everybody wants to swim the 50 free. Everybody wants to do that. But if you're, you know, this tall and, you know, your fast switch muscle fibers are pretty much non-existent, you're not going to swim the 50 free. You may want to swim it, you know, so really knowing what, what you excel at, um, you know, what type of training you, you're good at and what, what makes you better, you know, and don't, don't kind of lie to yourself and don't trick yourself. Well, I don't really want to do the 400 IM practice. No, that's actually what you're really good at. And that's why you're the successful swimmer. You are because of the things that you've been challenged to do. So when you get to the next level, do that. You know, I, I think for our program and a lot of the club programs out there, um, you know, they don't try to get everything they can out of them, you know, as their, their, uh, their age group swimmers. You know, there's some clubs out there that, that are really, really good and they have dryland coaches and they have, you know, all this crazy stuff and, and they're basically running their programs like colleges and they get a ton out of them at the 18 and under level. And those are some of the best swimmers that we have that go to these big, big universities. But with the same, the same, you know, in the same breath, they get so much out of them at an early age. Sometimes it's hard for them to go to the next level because they're not doing as much or more work. And I think that that's always tough. Um, I, I take pride that our kid, I know our kids are going to get more weight room work when they go to the next level, they're going to train, you know, harder at the next level. And, but they're prepared to do that because we've at least given them, you know, a good chunk of that. So 
that's a, uh, you know, I think that I've, you've probably had the same conversation with coaches. There are certain clubs that teams might not want to recruit from because they know how much they train at an early age and how much distance and volume that they're not going to be able to, to help them and supplement that. So, um, you know, I think that that's a big part of, of knowing that your kids can keep getting better because you haven't basically given them everything that they, that they need at that level. Like you've left, you've left more, more meat on the bone for them, if you will. Matt, a lot of college coaches will say to me, and, and you, you just spoke to this, they'll ask me, well, how much has so-and-so lifted? And I said, we don't do any weights. It's all body weight, you know, functional fitness, teaching them the correct movements. And college coaches are ecstatic when they hear that. Because now there's this whole other training modality that they haven't, our athletes haven't experienced yet. And it's just another stepping stone that they can take. You know, and, and I, I think that there's components of lifting that are really important and that a lot of clubs do a great job with. Um, but I also feel like it's something that we can leave for them when they get to the next level. You know, and, and I, really, I really have seen coaches be excited that, you know, wow, once we put these kids on weights, let's see, you know, how much faster they get as a result of it. Um, and our kids like that, too, because it's something new and exciting that they haven't done at the club level. Yeah, I think introducing them at that age is helpful because then they know they can go in and do some of that stuff. But I think that that's, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, for me personally, I don't want to injure a kid, especially in the weight room. So, you know, we do keep it a lot of body weight stuff. I mean, we have added exactly. some of the Olympic lifts and some of that stuff, not to the level that there's clubs out there that I know they do. They do a ton of that. Um, but, you know, like you said, that gives that gives the coaches excitement to like, hey, you know what? They've lifted a little bit, but they're going to come in. Hopefully, they're going to get bigger and stronger and be able to – that's going to be the next step of their training. I mean, for, for our club, we use the American development model for our kids to get up through the levels of our program. So every group they go up, they're going to practice a little bit more often or they're going to have more duration for that practice. Obviously, the training is going to be a little bit harder. Um, but that builds in that next step. So they're not at 10 years old swimming as, you know, as much as the 14- or 16-year-old kids – because that's the only, you only have a couple of groups on your team. You know, having a bigger team is always, there's always challenges, but that also allows us to have multiple levels so the kids can, can progress through it. And even our, our high school kids, some of our best high school kids, they don't do doubles until they're junior, until they're sophomores or juniors, just because coming into the high school training, they're there six practices a week, you know, every day in the afternoon and on the weekends. And they're training harder. They're doing the, the, you know, the weights and the dry line and stuff that we're doing. So they're already going to get a big bump in their training from eighth grade year to coming in a freshman. So to add two or three more mornings on as a freshman, I don't think is, I don't think is good. I think adding that the next year. And I, I, I think we've seen pretty good jumps out of our kids that are when they're sophomores, because, you know, that ends up being the next level of, you know, the next step, I guess, for them in, uh, in doing a little bit more work. Uh, uh, Matt, so I mean, that speaks right to the experience that I've had, like I, like I talked about. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, because I, I get this question every year, and every year I, I struggle with it. Um, and I get asked this question by my mentors when I go to them for help. Uh, and that is, when you know in your heart that the place one of your athletes has chosen is probably not the right choice for them, how do you have that conversation? Do you have that conversation? I think uh, being a young dad, I I'm learning how to uh, manage some of those situations. Uh, but what's your experience in, in trying to, you know, ha have hands off. It they have to own their decision. But at the same time, you know, have that leadership piece within you that's comfortable saying to an athlete, look, I, I don't think this is the right choice. Yeah. You know, that's tough because I I've, you know, my personal opinion when it comes to that is, you know, I, I love the fact that I, some of these kids that are going off to school, I've coached them for six, seven, eight years. And they, you know, in practice, sometimes I've gotten called dad because I spend more time with them than their own family members. So I, I love that part of it. But when it comes to those decisions, I really want them and their families to make that decision because I might have a predetermined interaction with a coach that, you know, I might, not think this coach can do this, or I might think this coach is amazing. And, you know, they don't, you know, it's because of maybe the way they treated me. So I try to not let my biases influence kids' decisions because just because I might have a pre, you know, predetermined uh, thought on a program doesn't mean that a kid can't go in there and, and be successful. And we've had kids that have gone to schools and, and not really enjoyed it and end up going to somewhere else. Um, 
you know, and, and do really well. So, you know, for me, it's one of those things that it's tough. And, and I think, you know, I think, again, I think they have to own the, own their decision. The one thing that I want, you know, that I, that I wish that there was more of is having that conversation with some of those college coaches, because, you know, and I tell my kids all the time, I said, listen, I'm going to be honest when a college coach calls me and what, what are they getting? So I have a kid who's now, um, who's going to college and uh, going to a, a, a really good program. And one of my friends, one of my good, good uh, coaching friends actually is the coach there. And the kid came to me after his, I think, sophomore year. And he asked me about recruiting. I said, listen, I said, I'm going to be honest. I said, the way that you train right now, the answer that I'm going to give to a college coach, you're not going to like the answer. I said, you have, you, you can change what my answer is, but right now I'm not going to tell a coach and somebody that I respect that, Hey, this person's great. This person's awesome. And then you get there and you know, you're not doing the work. You're not in on time. You're doing all the things that we talk about what you need to be doing. And the kid did a really nice job. And, and we sat down actually six months later at, through after the, the end of the high school season, end of the summer and, and did some really good stuff. And I said, listen, I said, now my answer is completely diff different than it was. And, it, and the kid was four, you know, 15, 16 years old. So, you know, teenagers are always going to change and, and mm -hmm. mature a little bit, but you know, I, I, I'm always honest with my kids when they ask me like, well, what do you think? I'm like, well, I'm going to tell the coach the truth because that's what they need to hear from me. So I actually enjoy when the college coaches reach out because it gives me a chance to tell them, Hey, here's the type of stuff that you're getting from this person. And they do this stuff really well. This is what they need to work on. So, um, you know, that's, you know, that I think that, that, that helps. I, I had one of our swimmers went and it, we, I know we've talked about this, but went to the university of Florida, one of the first things I got a phone call the next morning, I was sitting in my office. It was after Saturday morning practice and, uh, and Ross had committed to Florida that Friday night. And Nesty calls me, he said, Hey man, he's like, you know, we're excited to have him. And like, just so you know, like anything that we can do to help you over this next 12 months. And I was like, wait, anything to help me? Like he's, he's going to be in your hand. So it, it was cool that they were like, Hey, we want him to, even when we went to trials in 20 in uh, 2016, um, he was swimming for Florida for a year. Like, listen, like you got him to this level, you should be on deck. Like he's going to swim for your club team, which, which made a big deal for our club team because when they got to that level, when we got to trials, all of our kids back home were watching Ross because he was swimming for heat. If he was swimming for Florida, that would be cool. And they would still probably, some of them would have still watched it. But, you know, I'm there on deck. We can put on social media. We can live stream some of this stuff. It was a big deal at our club. And, and honestly, those coaches, I respect a lot when they, when they don't let their egos get in the way of like, hey, you know what, you guys are doing some great stuff at the club level. And we're, we're grateful that we have your kids. And, you know, what can we do to help support that? Even, even Ross's senior year, I got a call from Nesty like, hey, what do you think? And he hasn't really done some of the things that I know he wanted to do. And I said, Hey, he loves to train. You tell me how, how great he trains. So in the 500 this year, and I get you, I bet you it'll be something different. He'll enjoy it. And so in the 500 opposed to the IM his senior year at SCCs and, you know, did, did well. And it was just a different transition, but the fact that those coaches reach out and, and want to know about the kid tells me that they want to know about the kid. It's not just about, well, how fast is this kid? It's about the whole person and how can they help the person grow as a, as a, as a person, not just a, a swimmer. And I, and I respect the coaches that do that a lot. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that, that has been my experience with the Florida staff, um, the Florida staff that there's ne that, that that's in place now. And when Greg Troy was there, I remember when my, my phone used to ring, sometimes it would ring, we'd be in the middle of a staff meeting and I'd say, guys, this is Greg Troy. I have to take this one. And uh, he would ask me very similar things. What are, what are some sets that she loves to do? What are some things that I can do that, that'll really help motivate her? And for somebody like that to reach out to a club coach, you know, that, go, that goes a long way. And, and, and Greg's famous for that. And, you know, I, I feel comfortable that if I ever had a question, I could call him and he'd answer it, you know. And, and when you have a college program or college coaches that are like that, you know, now when we have athletes at the, that level, you're so much more comfortable in sending them to a school where you know they're going to be taken care of and you know that they're cared about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have athletes, some of my best athletes go to schools and I'll never hear from, from the coaches. Um, but, you know, you can help your athlete find those places. And, and it, they don't only exist in Division One either. I want, I want to make sure that that's, you know, that's well known. Oh yeah. I had a, I had a girl that swims at local division three school and um, didn't swim as well as she wanted to her freshman year. And, 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 um, and I was kind of bummed that the coach didn't reach out to me beforehand, but she was a breaststroker. She, that's what she was good at. And 
she was going to help their program in that in those events and that's fine um but after the end of the season he actually he reached out to me and said hey can we grab some lunch i'd love to talk about her because obviously you know what we did training wise and stuff didn't really wasn't really good for her and she was so successful coming into our program and you know i i think it's hard to be humbled sometimes and to like oh i screwed up but you know it's if, if you truly care about the kid then why wouldn't you spend that time getting to know the person who's been with that kid for so much longer of a period of time in their growth and development of their career. So, um, you know, I, and again, it doesn't mean that kids won't be successful if, if, if those coaches don't reach out. But I think as a club coach, um, it's probably not talked about enough from the club coaching side, but I think it's important in us club coaches like to have that feedback and like to have those conversations because we want to see the kid, per, you know, perform at the next level just as well as that college coach does. Yeah, their 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 job is on the line if that coach if that kid goes there and swims well. But you know, our pride a little bit's on the line. Like, hey, this kid's going there. We want to keep following. And we want to keep seeing him getting better. And um, you know, so I, I think it, it works both ways to have that that line of communication. Matt, how often are you inviting college coaches on the pool deck at your practices? Um, I don't really have, I don't really invite them. A lot of times they're like, Hey, we're, you know, we'd like to come on the pool deck. And, you know, so I would say, you know, probably, especially over the last couple of years, having some of the, the, the swimmers that we've had that we've been fortunate enough to, to, to be recruited by some of the bigger schools. I mean, probably once a month, we'll probably have a coach come up depending on the year and, or the, 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 the season and stuff that we're in. So, and I think it's, it's fun. I think it's fun for the kids to see, like, you know, I'll tell them like, Hey, you know, we had last, last uh, fall, we had West Virginia come on deck and, you know, he, they came up and they were, the kids were excited. I've had, I've had Lars on our pool deck several times from Kentucky and, you know, and, and coaches from all over. And it's, it's a lot of fun because I think our, our practice environment's a little bit better because, <laughs> you know, it's not just coach Matt, Matt watching. It's, you know, these guys are what these, these coaches are watching. So I remember um, this particularly, we, we, Ray Luz came and he was on deck. We, we had the best practice we had all year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's like an instantaneous thing. Uh, yeah. And I always kid Ray about that when I see him. That was the, the best practice we had is that the day that you visited. So, yeah. uh, for sure. I think it's an important part of the process, right? And, and having coaches from different schools and different conferences. And, and it also, <clears throat> it helps you as the head coach because the parents are going to trust you a little bit more in the process. Um, and right now, you know, that, that's so important because the recruiting environment is so different this year than any other. Mm -hmm. One thing, Matt, that I think, you know, you and I have to address today, and, and we did on our show uh, last week, uh, is the elimination of college programming. Since you and I have talked, another program has been cut in William and Mary. Yeah. How are you talking to your athletes about this? If, if you, you haven't had time, because you've been off for a week, but... <clears throat> You know, how do you address this with parents when, when their kids are looking at schools? I know for me, I always put every Ivy League school on, on our, our kids who are fast enough, so summer juniors, I, I always put the Ivy League schools on their list just because if I know that they can get into those places, that's a degree that's going to open up a lot of doors for them in life. Absolutely, yeah. I would have never thought in a million years that a program like Dartmouth would be cut. Yeah. I would have never thought in a million years that a perennial conference power like William and Mary, also one of the best academic schools in the country, would get cut. Here we are. What, what are your thoughts on what's happening and what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it is, it's a little scary and, and probably more so on the men's side of swimming just because there are less programs and it seems to be that that's, that's what gets cut more often. I think with COVID, I don't think, uh, you know, I think everybody's kind of, you know, always on the chopping block or at least uh, nobody's really safe these days, but I, I think talking to the kids about looking at those, those programs that have stability, you know, with coaching, have stability with, you know, with even not having issues in terms of you know, any sort of violations or any sort of, you know, recruitment issues and things like that. I think those, those, those programs that the schools can trust and, and they know that they're doing the right things and that they're, you know, they don't have to probably put too much into um, are probably the, the safer ones. I, you know, I, hate to say it, we're, you know, we're, we're swimming. We're not, we're not a, we're not bringing in all the money. So they want to have programs that probably aren't causing too much trouble and they don't have to really w worry too much about, but um, it shows you that there's no, there's no program safe. I mean, Iowa getting cut, um, you know, a big 10 school like that. I mean, that you would never think that um, a place that's got a, one of the greatest facilities in the country they've hosted, I think big tens and I think NC2As and they're not going to have a collegiate team 
swimming out of that, that facility. It, it's crazy. So um, you, you never know which one's going to be next, you know? And so some of the programs that I've got a girl going to Akron, she's starting, she just started. Um, and and the, the parents talked to me like, Oh man, what, you know, they just cut four sports, like, or they, there was rumors they were going to cut sports. And I'm like, listen, like Brian's done a great job there. They've won seven Mac titles. They have two or three programs that are really good. Their soccer team, you know, their, their, their track team and, uh, and swimming. I said, they're not going to touch those, you know, and they have to keep so many school, so many sports to be division one eligible, but you still, you don't know. Um, you know, you, know it, you, you mentioned Akron. I mean, arguably Brian has done as good a job there as any coach at any program in the country year after year after year with that women's program, just a phenomenal job. Matt Crispino at William and Mary had a kid go 18 six this year in the 50. He was seated fourth going into NCAAs. I mean, you just, you, you don't think that it can happen to you. And then all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. And I, I know that kids are, are contemplating taking gap years. And then there's the whole Arizona state. Bob's going to redshirt everybody out there at Arizona state. And um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that you never thought six, eight months ago would be happening in the, in, in collegiate sports, obviously swimming um, in our business, but you know, that those are the, the decisions that sometimes you have to make. I think, if a kid's going to go to school and they want to be a part of a program and obviously want to start, you know, getting their education going, you know, I, you know, I think that that's important, but you know, this year of swimming, no matter, no matter what school, no matter what conference, it's going to look a lot different than it ever has. And, 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 and I, and I think even into next year and the year after that, things are going to change because you know, the, the, the budget's not going to allow certain things for, for programs. Right. A hundred percent. As you and I sit here, I'm checking the updates on my phone. New York Yankees just dropped out of the top five in the MLB power rankings. And the Indians, I think, are fifth now. It's unreal, man. It looks right. like I'm going to be taking a trip out to Hudson. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, one thing, Matt, I, I want to do a quick, quick fire session with you. The women's 800 free 2021 Olympic Games. Are they going under eight minutes? Uh, Katie, you mean, is Katie Ledecky going under eight minutes? <laughs> I, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to say yes. Tony Betis made a great point. He said that I think she'll go under eight, but she's going to need to be pushed to go under eight. He might be right on with that. Yeah. Okay. Is it going to take 20 point high to win the men's 50 free? Uh, I think so. I think so. You know, it's crazy. And I know we're doing rapid fire, but I want to give some commentary. So I think that with, COVID and a lot of kids not being able to race. And, and you and I've talked about this before. We, we did a meet a couple of weeks ago with our kids and we had a ton of lifetime best times. And I think what I've attributed to the kids, we're, we're not even training as much. We're not doing some of the dry line that we've been doing for years because we only have so much time and space. But I think people are starting to appreciate, you know, oh, I had to go to some practice. Oh, I've got to do this. I'm going to do that. Oh, it's a drag. But not having that for several months or weeks or however long you were out, I think people are starting to appreciate that. Coaches are starting to, you know, it was nice they had that little break. Swimmers are excited about that. But now that they're back, back into it, it's like, you know what? You know, I had this taken away. I had a girl that's like, man, I wish I would have actually tried a little bit more at this meet because I knew I was going to go into NCSAs in a couple of weeks, but NCSAs never happened. So she didn't swim maybe some of the times she was hoping at our championship meet because it wasn't really a big deal for her. And so I think kids are starting to appreciate that. So I think we're going to see some special stuff when we do get real competitions back because there's people out there working their tails off and they're just chomping at the bit to get in the race. No doubt about it. Phelps is 403 in the 400 IM. When does that go down? I don't know, man. It's, it's people just keep getting faster. When, when you think that something's not going to be touched, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it, it'll happen at some point. I mean, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe in the next uh, two Olympic cycles, you, you think most of those records are going to start to come off the books. You know, I, I, it's, it's nice to see those t uh, 2009 super suit uh, records start to come off the books because then, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, we're getting better. How, how cool is that? You know, like you, you're seeing that stuff go down. The world is fast as Jerry likes to say, all right, men's 500 free. Does somebody go under 405 in the next three years? Man, I don't know. Kid out down in Florida, he's training his butt off and he's, he's been swimming pretty fast. I don't know. I think he's got a shot, but, um, at some point, like how fast is, is 
is fast enough. Like when are we going to get to that? Like Caleb Dressel, like how fast is that 50? Like 10 years ago, you know, if a kid broke, you know, 20 or, you know, in the 19, like low 19s, you're like, wow, that's amazing. Like nobody's ever going to go 18. And then all of a sudden we do that. And it's like, so I don't know. I, I would, I would, I, I'm always on the side that I think kids are just going to get better and better and athletes are going to get stronger. So, you know, I think that'll happen over the next three years. I mean, think about it. You and I growing up in the sport and as young coaches, Tom Yeager went 19.06 and what, 94 or 95. Think about it. Dolan went 408 in the 500 and 97. I mean, yeah. those, those were epic swims and it took a while to get there, but, but we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, Matt, awesome talking to you, man. Our bet yeah. is up. We're going to find out in about three weeks what's happening, who's yes. going where. And uh, we wish you guys at Heat all the best of luck. Just a reminder to all our viewers, you can find all of the replays of Coach's Corner at fitterandfaster.com slash Coach's Corner slash live. You can check out our page. Find this uh, recording up there, and you can learn about the transition from club to college. Matt, thanks so much. How can all people right. get in touch with you if they have questions? Um, you know, so my, uh, my, my email, they can just email me with my school email. It's, uh, Davis M at Hudson dot K 12 dot O H dot U S I believe. It or is you that. can also, yeah, there <laughs> I you have go. it right here. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Um, yeah. but yeah, if anybody has any questions out there, I, I, you know, I'm a swim coach. I love my club and I love my kids and my families, but ultimately I want to see kids, um, get to the next level, no matter what program they are. So if, if anybody has any questions, um, even if they want to chat, um, you know, they can reach me that way and I'd be more than willing to, to help them and provide whatever information I have for the, that I can for them. Matt, thanks so much, man. I look forward to seeing you soon. If I don't see you soon, I will see you at trials or we'll have to follow through on our bet. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. I've had a, had a blast. It was great. Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, tune into all fitter and faster programming. And all we right. will hope to see you all soon. Take care. Later.